What's up, guys? Thanks for joining us today. This is Capital Interactive, and I'm your host, Basim. We've got a great topic for you today. Today, we're going to talk about letters of credit and give you the basics of letters of credit. We're not going to go into too much details, but we're going to make sure that you have a high level understanding so you might know when to use letters of credit in your business. So first of all, let's just talk about from a high level perspective what a letter of credit is. A letter of credit is basically the promise to pay. A bank will issue a letter of credit on your behalf to another party stating that when certain parameters are met, they are guaranteeing payment. And that's really what the basis of a letter of credit is. There's two major types of letters of credit that we're going to go into today. One is called a commercial letter of credit. The second one is called a standby letter of credit. And I'm going to tell you a little bit at a high level how those work. But at the most basic sense, a letter of credit is a promise to pay and you're shifting the risk associated with that promise to pay from the company or individual to the bank that's that issue in the letter of credit. So let's go ahead and talk about commercial letters of credit. Commercial letters of credit are the most kind of basic letters of credit that most people talk about. A commercial letter of credit is typically used when one party is issuing a letter of credit to another party for payment for a product or service. This is done a lot of times for international trade or trade between two parties that don't know each other very well. So for example, if you're buying a piece of machinery from China, you've only just met the company, you don't really know them. You wanna ensure that the money that you send is actually gonna get you the product that you, that you requested. So you might issue a letter of credit to that manufacturer as payment for your machinery. So how this will work is you will issue a letter of credit to that manufacturer. Before you issue the letter of credit, both you, the bank, and the recipient are all gonna negotiate the terms. You're gonna spell out what constitutes completion of, of, of the transaction and when the bank is obligated to make a payment. Many times this will come from, for example, um, shipping documentation. So a lot of times you'll have a third party verify that the product is on board. You'll have a bill of lading and you'll have uh, that type of information. Once those are furnished, many times those documents are then presented to the bank with the letter of credit and the bank is obligated to pay. And that's how it works. So in this situation, if you're buying the piece of machinery, you might have a third party inspect the piece of machinery. You might get the shipping documentation. And once those are, are, are received by you, the receiving party of the letter of credit, the, the manufacturer in China will go to his bank with your letter of credit, with all the documentations that have been pre-spelled out in the letter of credit when you guys were negotiating this ahead of time. They'll present that to the bank and the bank is obligated to pay. That's it. So the, the receiver of the letter of credit feels comfortable that they're going to get payment and the person that is issuing the letter of credit feels comfortable that they're going to get their service or their product. And that's basically how a commercial letter of credit works. There's There can be a lot of nuances, a lot of customization in these, but that's at a high level how these things work. Second type of letter of credit that we're going to talk about is a standby letter of credit. A standby letter of credit is basically a promise to pay. It's in place. It's a promise to pay if some kind of uh, obligation is, is met or not met. So a lot of times you'll see these used as performance bonds. Let's say you hire a firm to build you a piece of machinery in, manufacture, in your manufacturing site, and uh, you want to make sure that that machinery is completed before you actually pay them. Well, they might ask you to issue, uh, you might ask the um, person that's actually building it for you to issue a standby letter of credit that will guarantee completion. So what that happened, what that means is if they walk away halfway through the project, you will get paid out to help mitigate your losses and the expenses associated with you finishing that project or remediating whatever the issue is. So let's say you hire this firm, they issue a standby letter of credit that's, that's done as a performance bond and um, you are, they get about 70% through the, the project they go bankrupt. You can go to the bank and call on the letter of credit and that letter of credit will pay you. Those funds typically are, are, are then used to 
have you finished the installation of the project or finish whatever it is or help mitigate against your losses associated with them not completing the work that they're supposed to do. Another time you'll see these standby credit letters of credit is in performance bonds or not performance bonds, but bid bonds. So a lot of times companies will issue tenders and they'll be requesting people to give proposals. And a lot of times people might want to do a proposal that they don't intend on really executing on. So they might be trying to drive down prices or may try to collude with somebody else. So in those situations, a company that's issuing a tender or issuing a project for people to bid on, they might request what's called a bid bond. And what that bid bond does is that says, in the case that you win the contract, you have to execute on the contract based on the parameters of your proposal. And if you don't, then that bank gets, or that, or that customer gets payment from the bank for you not executing, because now they have to go through that process again with, another, with, with somebody else. And that's basically what it is. So there's, those are the really two major types of letters of credit out there. There's a lot of other nuanced ones, and you need to talk to your trade finance officer to get uh, advice on which one works best for you. But there's a few other things you want to understand about letters of credit. At the end of the day, the major point is you are shifting risk from the third party company to the bank. Now, in most cases, that's a good trade off because many banks are, are large, they do their due diligence, they've got a lot of uh, resources, and they know if these companies are good credit risks. But sometimes, if a letter of credit is issued from a small bank, that letter of credit might not even be as good as the as the uh, promise to pay from the from the company that's actually doing the work. So you really got to understand who's issuing the letter of credit and where the risk is being shifted to. You need to make sure that you're really digging into the details of what documentation needs to be provided on letters of credit because, you know, let's say you forget to include something. Well, that letter of credit, the bank has to pay if the parameters in the letter of credit are, are made. And so if you forget to include some check or include some piece that you wanted that, uh, third party to actually execute on, the bank is going to have to pay regardless. So you want to make sure beforehand you execute and you write everything in there that you really want. Another thing that we want to talk about is when you're actually issuing uh, letters of credit. Letters of credit are just that what they, what they sound like. They are a credit instrument and banks are going to look at it that way. It, re it requires an approval process. And many times banks are going to want to be cash secured. Well, cash secure doesn't mean that it's automatically going to get accepted. As we talked about in the past, you know, banks are going to risk rate their clients. There's going to be uh, a, amount of risk associated with each client. And if you're a high risk client, even if you cash secure the deal, there's still operational other risk associated with executing on that letter of credit. The bank might not be willing to take. But most of the time, if you have a cash secure deal, you, you'll usually be able to do it. Many times companies will not want to put cash in a, a separate account or a CD that they can't touch because it's secure in this line of credit, I mean, letter of credit. So they might want to get credit exposure in order to back their letter of credit. Well, the way banks typically do this is they actually issue a line of credit to you based on the parameters that we talked about in the podcast on line of credit. And you can get that information in this link right here. Once that line of credit is established, they'll establish what's called a sublimit for lines of uh, from letters of credit. Now, that sublimit for letters of credit is a pre-approved amount that you can use for letters of credit. Okay, and what what will happen is whenever you actually issue a letter of credit, that amount on your line of credit will be blocked off, and you won't be able to use it. So it's good because you're not blocking up cash. But in a way, you might be blocking off some liquidity that, that, that you would have had otherwise. So those are some of the things to consider. There's a cost associated with uh, letters of credit. It can vary dramatically depending on how the size of the letter of credit, what your relationship is with the bank, what type of letter of credit is, and things like that. But in the ballpark, if you want to get a rough idea of um, what they are, they're generally anywhere from a half a percent all the way to two, two and a half, three percent of the actual letter of credit amount. Well, if the letter of credit's large, that could be a sizable fee. If you're issuing a million dollar letter of credit, that could be $30,000, you know? So those are things you need to talk about and, and, and discuss with both 
your client, with your banker, and with your trade finance officer. Many times paying that fee is well worth it if you're dealing with an entity that has a lot of risk associated with it, or if you're dealing with an entity that you don't know very well, it might be worth it for you to pay $30,000 to issue that letter of credit. And you might be able to um, negotiate some of those costs with your counterparty. Anyways, the, these are just high level things to, to understand about a letter of credit. Uh, we're gonna have to go into more detail on them at, in a further pot in other podcasts, but we wanted to make sure that you understood the basics and know that these tools are out there to help you in situations like international trade you know, or, or when you're trying to um, get some kind of a project done for you. So um, just make sure that you negotiate the language up front. You understand what the costs associated with them are. You understand who the bank that's issuing it is and understand the parameters. There's a lot of other types of nuances with letters of credit. There's transferable letters of credit. There's letter of credit that can be broken up. A lot of different things like that. So you want to make sure that you understand those parameters and your trade finance officer at your bank is typically the person that explains that stuff to you. So feel free to reach out to them. Uh, you know, let us know if, if these, these podcasts are valuable to you. We're going to continue to do them. We've got some great information coming up. We're going to do additional podcasts on letters of credit, going into a little bit more detail. We wanted to make sure that you guys had a high level understanding. Uh, thanks a lot. And we'll see you on the next one. Peace. <laughs>